This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. We'll make a start there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, this screening of 90 Days. My name is Philip Murphy. I'm director of the Institute for Commonwealth Studies. Um, you'll have seen from the programme how we intend to, to do this. Um, Jack and I are going to say a few words. We're going to play the film, then have a Q&A session. And uh, Professor Gavin Williams is going to round off with some remarks, uh, and then we'll have a, a reception. This event is part of a broader project uh, the Institute is running to digitise the papers of uh, Ruth First and celebrate her <coughs> life and achievements. Those of you who attended the, the launch of the Digital Archive earlier in the summer um, will know the tremendous amount of work that's already been done on it. And I'd like to take this opportunity um, to thank the team behind this project. Um, Leo Zelig, Mike Mahone, Vanessa Rocco, uh, uh, Virgilio uh, Chikamise, and Rob Kenyon. You would also, I hope, uh, forgive me for saying that we are still actively seeking funds to uh, finish the project, and any, any suggestions for potential support uh, would be greatly appreciated. And I'd like to thank the, the Open Society Foundations for supporting this event, uh, and particularly Hugh McLean, our contact at the OSF. But my main um, uh, task this afternoon, an absolutely delightful one, is to introduce Jack Gould, um, the director of 90 Days. Jack's a key member of an extraordinary generation of filmmakers who in the 1960s and 70s used the medium of television as well as cinema to produce challenging and pioneering work which lost, has lost none of its power to provoke uh, and to fascinate. <coughs> Where immensely grateful to Jack for making this copy of the film available for, for the screening today and for his generous support and encouragement since this event uh, was first uh, thought of. Doing a bit of background research on the reception of 90 days, I typed the title into the Times Digital Archive, uh, the friend of all contemporary British historians. <laughs> and, and one of the things that came up was the actual running schedule for the day it was broadcast. And there it was, BBC One, on Thursday, 23rd of June, 1966, at 9.25 p.m., immediately after the Petula Clark show. <laughs> this might sound like a, a quirky little detail, but I think that actually goes some way towards explaining why Jack and, and some of his near contemporaries made such an extraordinary impact on post-war cultural life. They were lucky to be starting their careers uh, during Hugh Carton Green's benign and enlightened period as Director General of the BBC. But there were, of course, severe limits on this new spirit of liberalism, and filmmakers who pushed the boundaries ran the risk of their work not being seen at all. A case in point, of course, is uh, Peter Watkins' The Wall Game, made the year before, which used a similar style of documentary realism to dramatise the horrifying effects of a nuclear strike on the UK. Under severe pressure from the government, the BBC banned the film from transmission, and it remained banned for 20 years. 90 Days escaped that fate, but it was subject to fierce criticism by friends of the apartheid regime in the UK. None were more vociferous than Harold Soroff, the chairman of the Africa group of the Monday Club. Soroff was always on the lookout for the hidden hand of the Kremlin. As an MP in 1973, he even condemned the Straub's hit, part of the Union, as socialist propaganda. But he devoted much of his time to defending white domination in southern Africa, portraying African nationalism pretty much without exception as a Marxist conspiracy. Anyone who'd followed Soroff's career up to that point would probably not have been particularly surprised when in his memoir Inside Boss in 1981, Gordon Winter named Soros, uh, Soroff as a willing tool of South African intelligence. 
Incidentally, one of the main criticisms leveled at the film by Soroff and his ilk was that it failed to make clear Ruth First communist sympathies. We might want to talk about that later on. Yet if Jack and his colleagues risked censorship and criticism, the medium of television offered them an extraordinary opportunity to reach a mass audience. <clears throat> uh, not to put it too finely, the kind of people who watched This is Petula Clark. BBC Two was in its infancy, and for most people the choice was between BBC One and ITV. So the BBC was very much the market square. And whereas today in our multi-channel, multimedia world, we can jump between programs and websites um, in the secure knowledge that we need never encounter anything likely to challenge our tastes and prejudices. By contrast, in 1966, a film like 90 Days was all the more controversial because it reached such a wide and diverse audience. It seemed to come out of the blue in the middle of a far more conventional menu of light entertainment. That element of serendipity added to its power to evoke strong feelings, both positive and negative. People remember the early television films of Jack Gold and his near contemporaries like Peter Watkins and Ken Loach, not just as movies, but as events in their lives, often transformative events. I can vouch for that. I vividly remember seeing what's probably Jack's most famous film, The Naked Civil Servant, which he made for Thames TV. I was 13, and I saw it for the first time on a little black and white portable TV in my bedroom in Hull. I'm sure my parents would have been horrified. They would have died if they knew known what I was watching. But that just added to the thrill. I remember being genuinely disturbed by it, but also incredibly excited. He was a world of worlds a million miles away from the one I grew up in. Values completely at odds with the one that, ones I've been taught. Modes of feeling and expression I barely knew existed. What television in those days could do, thanks to the work of Jack and his contemporaries, was to challenge its audience, to give them a sense that there were alternative worlds and alternative values. I think that essential insight that your world is not the only world is at the heart of any humane education. And for many people in the 60s and 70s, television was a great educator. It's particularly appropriate that we celebrate the life of Ruth First in this way and mark the solemn anniversary of her death 30 years ago by showing this film. It's no coincidence that a later dramatization of her life, scripted by Sean Slovo, was entitled A World Apart. Ruth First was someone who instinctively made that leap of imagination, connecting with other worlds, supporting the struggle of peoples whose experience of life was so different from that of the white settler community, and working towards a future which she hoped would be radically different from the present, working towards a different, better world. Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Gunn. Um, thank you for that. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to show this film. It's a long time since I've seen it, apart from reminding myself about this uh, this afternoon. Um, and the origins of it might are, are of interest, I think. Um, I was, came out of an old television program called The Tonight Program, which some of you may remember. If you could speak up, you're going to have to speak up oh, a can, little. <coughs> sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. I came out of a television program called The Tonight Program, which was a five nights a week documentary magazine program on television. It was very, very successful. We used to get the audiences 10, 11, 12 million people a night <clears throat> in those days. And I came up through documentary background and made some documentaries. Um, and then I was transferred to the documentary department BBC, because I've been making lots and lots of very short films, 10 minute, 15 minute films, and now I was stretching my wings, if you like, into longer periods of documentary. And the, it was a very benign atmosphere. You could think of an idea, and if you could persuade your producer in charge of the department that it was a good idea, you could go and make it. Um, BBC was a tremendous patron. 
and its output was so big they could afford to take risks. So I was working in the documentary department and I was very interested in a couple of things at the time. I'd just been rereading Kersler's Darkness at Noon, which I thought was a tremendous book. Um, to, you know, showing history and its context and a very strong narrative um, line through. But one of the things that interested me was the process whereby the staunch communist was made to confess to his political crimes. I also was getting very interested in brainwashing as a possible subject. We read Sargent's book about, I can't remember what it's called, about brainwashing. And I was flirting, if that's the right word, with the idea of doing a program about brainwashing for the documentary department, which they were getting interested in. And then I saw, I think it was in the Observer, an extract from 117 Days, which was a, you know, from Ruth's book, and read that and thought that this combined everything I was actually interested in at that time. And I went to the head of my department and posited it as a possible program. No idea how or what or where it was going to be made. Well, I knew where it was going to be made if he said yes. But the form of it, I was unsure about. <clears throat> but I had run a little work with actors beforehand, some little drama reconstructions, but was very inexperienced with actors. Um, I'd never been to drama school or brought up in the theatrical tradition. My background was documentary and film. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I realized that there was a reconstruction possibility in this book um, and you know, suggested it to my head of department and he said, yes, of course, you. that's a very good idea, we can reconstruct it. And I said, I'm not sure which actress is probably right for it, maybe someone like Janet Sussman, who was young and South African, and he said, no, we don't do actors and actresses and documentaries, we do the real people. You can do it if you can get the original person to play the part, the reconstructed part. I don't, can't remember the actual period now, we're talking about nearly 50 years ago, but at what point I met Ruth. Um, but it was a bit uh, daunting to actually think I would have to try and persuade the author of the book, who I, I don't think I'd met, um, to reconstruct her own part with all the sort of trepidation that I would feel about it. Anyway, I, we met and we agreed that they would do it and that she would portray herself. So we then started to work on the script, which is basically an adaptation of her book. Um, and the film was posited at that time, I think, in about an hour. I had no real idea of how long it would run or anything. It was very naive in drama scripts and working with actors and reconstructions and all those things. I'm absolutely an innocent abroad, but with the BBC backing me and providing crews and designers and everything else, it was a very solid basis. So one of the things, I, I started rereading the book for obvious reasons, and there was a phrase in it that was the kind, the source of why the book, I think, is so remarkable. She says, at one point, then she thought she was going to be imprisoned. I embarked upon a campaign to accommodate myself to the prospect, not of 90 days in the cell, but years. The sooner I got used to the idea, I decided, the more easily I would bear it. Once convinced I was able to read, study, perhaps even write, at worst I could store experiences and impressions for the day I could write. I would struggle to erase self-pity. And I thought that was a very good summary of what came out in this book. It's full of most, as you know, most extraordinary detailed reportage of her experiences in solitary confinement. And also a wonderful setting for the historical context of her experiences. It was a bit like the darkness at noon. The chief character in that is telling us about his life in uh, imprisonment and then he remembers incidents from his past life which led him to that situation. 
and Ruth used the graffiti in her cell as little signposts to integrate into the book, which we followed in the film, of the historical context. For instance, there would be a piece of graffiti about Sharpton, and we used stills of Sharpton and a different voice to Ruth, the narrator, describing factually the importance in the uh, incident of Sharpton. So we could come out of the cell, which most of our life is spent in the and put it in a historical context. So that was one of the wonderful things about the book. It wasn't just a personal story. Had no self pity. I mean, she certainly was great at avoiding that, but actually put the story into a historical context. So, using that structure, we worked out the script that would enable us to reconstruct as much as possible the forensic detail of her observation of her life in itself and trying to put it on the screen. Um, in very difficult circumstances, the, in the sense that I say difficult, I don't compare what she actually went through, obviously, but the physical problems of actually making a film in a cell a few feet dimensional, um, in corridors, etc., etc., and police stations, was technical problems, nothing you know, um, difficult or impossible. Um, so we had to create the life she led in the cell, which she also narrated. Um, letting us inside her psyche, if you like, what she was thinking of being, all of which she spelt out in a very objective, factual way. It was a wonderful piece of basic reporting of it. And we made the film. Um, the places we found to make for we couldn't go to South Africa, basically, as we could, there was no money to make that sort of film. We found a deserted police station just outside Oxford, a place called Brill, which we took over and reconstructed the cell, which was about the same dimensions that she originally was in. The corridors, the iron gates, the padlocks, the interrogation rooms were all done there. The uh, library she was arrested in was my local library at Crouch End. <laughs> <laughs> sort of fairly modernish looking thing. It wasn't one of the old Victorian libraries. <coughs> what I imagine it might be like in South Africa. Um, her ride to Pretoria from Johannesburg, we shot in, through, in a car through Richmond Park, hoping I might see a deer, which could possibly be. <laughs> <laughs> the point of view when she looks through her cell windows to the square at Pretoria was shot through some fake window with iron bars and Shepherd's Bush Green. Um, so we constructed what I hope was a realistic picture, not a near authentic picture, what I imagined with her advice, of course, what the images would be like um, in South Africa. The casting was obviously her. Um, by definition, we had no question about it, playing herself. And we were extraordinarily fortunate. And one that she I was very nervous about asking her to do it, but I think she knew the importance of the making of the film um, would be, and she agreed to do that. And she, as you know, is a stunning woman, very attractive, very intelligent, um, very self-effacing, um, with a tremendous face that you could watch while you heard her voice telling us about what was going on. Um, there's a, <clears throat> a very famous Russian director called Kuleshov, which you may or may not have heard of, but he did a, an experiment. It's about film acting or film performance, or a way an audience would understand what's going on in the person's head. He took a short piece of film of an old Russian actor, he had no expression on his face at all, and he juxtaposed it with a picture of children in a playground, laughing, smiling, and joking. And he joined the two bits of film together, and he showed it to an audience, which is a fairly naive audience, it's about 1919 in Russia. And he said, what is this man feeling? And they said, oh, the picture of the old 
man, had sort of expressionless, and the children laughing and playing. They said, he's obviously very happy. He took the identical picture of the old man and put next to it a graveyard scene, a burial scene, and showed it to a different audience. And he said to the audience, what's the old man feeling? He's obviously very, very sad. He said, but the thought he was transmitting to an audience which they created was the emotions they thought was going in the old man's head because of the juxtaposition of the two images. It's the basis of virtually all filmmaking that we see today. So the ability of Ruth to act or not act was diminished by the fact that if you put that face, if it's not acting, in a situation of interrogation, or the cells, or the sound of padlocks, the keys, and things like that, you create or help create an idea of what's going on in her head, in addition to what she may be telling us. So the idea was in the normal business of making a film. You take images and sound and put them against faces and you can create an idea of what's going on in there. Which is what you do certainly with actors and actresses who are trained to create these things. But there's no the normal thing with an actor, you read through a script and you say, well, it, you come from this background and this is the situation, you explain everything we're discussing. That was obviously not necessary with Ruth. She knew. she knew her story. So you didn't have to do anything about, I mean, apart from being presumptions, it would be nonsense to try and tell her, tell the audience what you're really thinking here, what you're really thinking here. And don't forget you've got three children. And it was pointless mentioning that. So the problem for her, if there was a problem, which I wasn't really aware of, was not so much one of creating a performance, but her remembering what she'd been through, what her experience was. So that when we came to do the scenes in the, whatever they were, she had that obviously deep personal memory of what was going on. So the script was pared down from whatever the book is to less than now. And it was a matter of editing, editing, editing. But she was primarily the genitor the editing, cutting down to what was her story and the essentials of the what I call the context situations of the other parallel story of what was going on in South Africa. So it's like a script of a double helix. You've got two things going on at the same time. One is her personal story entwined with the history, the context, the context of whether it's torture of some of the other prisoners or the political situation on the Rebonia back <coughs> on the So she wrote a very cleverly constructed piece, just as it is in the book, of going in and out of her contemporary situation into the history. Um, the actors were herself, the others were South African actors who were working in England, the refugees. There's a small appearance by Esme Goldberg in it. Um, And so all the voices you heard were South African and South African accents. So we tried to be as authentic as we possibly could, filming in and around Shepherd's Bush. <laughs> um, we'd go into more detail about all this later, but the idea is, is that the film has this double helix structure following the book, and we tried to give as much factual history and information to help the texture, the background, the fabric of what her personal experiences were like in that circle, which she succeeded amazingly without any self-pity whatsoever. It's a very cool, forensic undertaking. There's no music in the film. Don't tell me what to think or feel. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> um, so the film is very bare. I get, you know, almost by necessity of what the subject matter was and the location was. But it's, her language is absolutely phenomenal, I think. It's so clear, clear, clean, and powerful, and of the essence. There's nothing wasted in her language or in her story. It's a, this is a copy of a film for 50 years old. Um, so it's not wonderful. It's black and white, which I love 
The first one, I know that you've already answered it to a certain extent, but can you tell us something about what it was like working with Ruth during the filming and how well you got to know her? The second question might not be for you, but perhaps for someone else in the audience, which is um, after she came out of prison in 63, and after also the book, the, the book 117 Days came out, there was talk within the exiled um, ANC, SACP community about whether Ruth had spoken. So I'm wondering whether the opportunity that she took very eagerly that you offered her at the start of the film was partly because she wanted to make it clear she did in the book, but also powerfully in the documentary, about what exactly had happened um, during that period of detention to that wider community of her comrades and fellow activists. I'll answer the second question first, because I can remember it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't know what her motivation was. I, I suspected that this was an extraordinary opportunity for her to reach an audience beyond the book television, the television audience. Um, and I think she realized, I hope she realized, certainly seemed to be early on that I was going to do an honest job with her and the book. I mean, she was the prime mover in the script, and I discussed everything with her and how we were going to do it, the elements of the past, etc. So she knew that this was an opportunity. I, what her motivation was, other than the idea that she could actually reach a bigger audience, um, a big public audience, I no idea whether we found out what we were doing for this. Oh, not yet. Anyway, yeah. anyway, but it was probably bigger than the book audience. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think she took opportunity, the opportunity to tell the story of that story to the audience um, very easily. Um, I met her, but obviously, um, I met her and Joe and the family several times. Um, very, very hospitable funny, gentle, warm, um, friendly, and we all got on very well together. Uh, I felt during the making of the film, she was, I thought, tremendous. I mean, I was very nervous about taking her to a cell, back into a cell, which was reconstructed to you know, But she didn't seem to outwardly affect the effect of mine. Obviously, it wasn't as bad as going in as it was originally, it was not after the film reconstructed. So without, but I was very nervous of trying to empathize with what she must be going through in a reconstruction of these events. But she was very equitable about it. I think she, she was so single-minded and realized this was a job that had to be done and had been reconstructing, reliving, remembering the situation. And she was very good about directing you know, the particular interrogations and what they were like various characters were and the delineations between them. So it was a, a hundred percent cooperation and commitment. And she could joke, she could laugh. We went to see a Lubitsch film together with the crew one evening while we were out there. I think it might have been with the which we was seeing how Nochka was the bit of our was Lubitsch's view of communism at the time. I the ironic film to see. Um, but the, I never got a feeling that she was other than totally committed to the project and totally being a human being, she was asking her to remember. But I was never felt that I was, I mean, I had to trust her that she was okay to do the film, to relive those moments. Um, and because she said, yes, I'm going to make the film, I, I got along with her. And as for the other thing, I really don't know the... I don't know about that. There's a possibility that she betrayed and this was an opportunity to rectify that. Maybe that was a motive, I just don't know the answer to can I Can I just develop that a little bit? It strikes me that in the final five minutes of the film, the tone changes. But 
for most of the film, here's Ruth first being an actress very well. When she gives that dialogue directly to camera at the end, when she's talking about her suicide attempt and explaining it, you feel that there's kind of, she is reliving it, that there is real emotion. Did you feel that at the time? Do you remember that? Yes, I do. I mean, uh, the mere fact of her looking into the lens, so that she's talking directly to us, um, and at the darkest part of her experience, I mean, it's, I think it, there was a, no element I didn't... I mean, everything else she's sort of reproducing what it was like to be in the cell, and the voice is yeah. calm, and the narration is objective and descriptive and wonderfully detailed very literal and eloquent, I thought. Um, but that was something else. This was, there was no, nothing to hide behind. This was a, a direct, confessional, open, bare, bearing her soul and thoughts to an audience. And the, the shot itself is very, very tight. The tightest yeah. shots yeah. that we do in the film. So there was nothing around the, that to detract from what was being said sort of the time out of the cell. Yeah. It was direct contact. Obviously quite deliberately decided to do it that way. Um, it was different. Yeah. Be, so, yeah. Thanks. It's so interesting. I'm halfway through the book, so it's um, especially so. And I wondered if you could tell us what the impact of the film was, the, the, the immediate impact after it was screened. Um, I, I mean, I, there were some very good reviews. I remember the, the Monday Club were up in arms. I think there were questions in the house. And there was a program, I think, that followed up that particular evening. I think BBC had a sort of late night review program, um, which dealt with the topics of the day, if you like. And I, this was the topic of that evening. And they brought in, I think, members of the Monday Club. Maybe they were sorry for themselves, but they also brought in Joe Slover. Um, as part of this coverage, of it. and he was wonderful. I mean, they, every time they put up an argument about her being a communist, for instance, and he would counter. He said, "You mean it's all right to do behave like that to communists? Is that what you're saying?" So I mean, he turned all their arguments about liberty and humanitarianism on their heads. I mean, he was obviously an extraordinary character himself, very able, speaker, very eloquent very passionate. Um, and I remember, of course, I was very committed to that side of it. He sort of dominated that evening's discussion. Um, but it lingered on a bit. I mean, I, I, I think people ask me, did you ever ask her if she was a communist? I said, no. I didn't think it was strange. I didn't think it was relevant <laughs> to know whether she was a communist. It was a, it was, to me, it was continuation of my original thoughts was about brainwashing. And I thought this was a perfect example of that. So the reasons why she was there, she was in prison, were obviously important, but it wasn't my prime motivation, if you like, in the film. It wasn't, from my point of view, as much a political statement as a, which it obviously was, but it wasn't the prime motivation, or the only motivation but then, this is interesting because you talked about Kerstler at the beginning. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that struck me about the film most was that the, the dramatic scenes are so kind of purred down. You, you have no real sense of her background. You don't know what she's done. Um, you very little sense of the society out there. Um, in the drama itself, it's so purred down. It could be about any repressive society, anyone under interrogation. But then you get these little clips of documentary narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Did you? I mean, did you always intend to put those documentary sections in? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 We were gathering, you know, the archive material yeah. at the time. Yeah. It was very much. Well, I thought it was essential yeah. to put that context. Yeah. In. I mean, I, my own background is strange. My father was a communist establishment. I had an uncle who fought in the international brigade. Mm -hmm. I had another uncle who was very left wing, fought in the Battle of Cable Street, things like that. <laughs> and I wasn't a member of any of those things. I thought 
all, all I remember were family arguments. <laughs> they wouldn't speak to each other directly. Before we went to Spain, became a Trotsky to the way that one was behaving. And so they had, had family arguments done through a third brother. They couldn't address, <laughs> address each other directly. They'd say, tell him that so and so and so. I'd say, tell him that so and so. So I remember at the age of eight or nine being this whirlwind political <laughs> argument, discussion, and emotion. So I decided not to become a member of any party. Even <laughs> though my heart, I think, was beating in the right place. Um, so I understood that you had to have the concept. I think it was vital. I think it is a double helix. To have it that form without those uh, contextual moments, with an objective voice and the rate of the top to earth, and the power of those stills, which I think was very strong, um, you know, the graininess of the blowing up nature of the moment, and the a real layer of authenticity to the piece, and put everything in context. Yeah, please. Yeah, thanks. I was, I was, thanks for showing that film. It's amazing. I mean, I, I, um, I uh, one thing I, I think was really powerful. It was, it was almost like it was. It was you, you know, you so, can we have a house lights? Yeah. 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 It's a bit, a bit intense. Yeah, we we saw a lot of the film you know, towards the you know you were taken in by what how what it's doing to roof and how it's horrible, and then you shock us. You show what happens to some of the black prisoners. They did they, 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 the physical, as, as well as I'm sure they were having the mental, then the physical torture. And, you know, that was a real jolt because I, I was completely, I mean, it was awful what's happened to her. And then, you know, it's like, the, it's the absolutely insidious and obscene the apartheid regime was, at least, yeah. to treat the white prisoners appallingly, but the black prisoners even more appallingly, yeah. you know, and it just was. Just, yeah, it just reminds you of kind of how how awful that, that, that those, those were, and that was really shocking, yeah. you know. But it was he kind of really really, really made the point. My, my my question for you though was really was your was your film were there copies of it? Did any of your copies did it ever get back into South Africa in any form, no, or do were you able to show it? You know, obviously I don't know, you know, I, I much later I, on. I really don't know um, what happened to it after. BBC showed it. Um, I didn't. I'm, the BBC were very good about it. I think they, they were a bit surprised by the reaction. I'm not sure if anybody said, "Did you know she was a communist?" <laughs> the fact that I answered, other than the way it answered, which I've been told you. Um, so I, I don't know if it ever got back. I hope it did, but I don't say it. I assume it could have been sent to see back there. I don't know if anybody knows what it was. Probably shown there about. So I, I can't answer. I hope it. Was. I don't know. Yeah, please. Uh, <laughs> um, obviously, she was such an unbelievably brave woman, and I think even braver for being an actor than she I can't imagine having to go through something like that again, even though it's pretend. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to know how long it took you to make the film, and how long she had to be actually... I, I don't think it's very long. I think it took maybe just over a couple of weeks. Um, 14 days. Yeah, something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, you should go home at night, you know, obviously. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, but, I mean, I, I was very nervous about asking you to, to do it. Oh. Obvious reasons, but she was. She obviously knew to put it. I don't know how much longer. We made it in 1966. So when was she released? A couple of years before, maybe. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's. Um, and, you know, and we met the family several times and you know, meals and things like that. So it's a very friendly, um, a nice, a nice atmosphere. It was very lovely. And Joe was very funny. It was a good sort of meals. 
she was tremendous for our, well, you know how tough she was. But it wasn't, you know, outside of the filming room, you know, she was wonderfully social, funny, and jokey. She was a great, great human being. You know, the thing that she did, two things she did, which I really appreciate, she took me one night to watch Arthur Fugar rehearsing the Blood Mouth, the Roundhouse. And she obviously knew it. And she knew it. I went to a sort of rehearsal. And I thought was going to say this in the Roundhouse, which is the most profound theatrical experience I've ever been through. There's no audience other than a few friends that were going there. No set, just the sort of grotty part of the Roundhouse as it then was. This astonishing play, this astonishing performances, blood performances going on, um, which was wonderful. And the other thing she did was introduce me to the story of an African farm, on the Shrine, which I tried for years to get made as a film and didn't succeed. But then she introduced me to that. That's a film that got away. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question back. I think the interrogators were very realistic. Mm -hmm. Coming from South Africa at that yes. time, uh, some of the comments they made sort of rang very true, like, you know, we respect women. You know, that, yeah. There was something about the arts interrogators who you know, sort of had this attitude that women were in a special category. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a self justification. Which came over yeah. quite well. Right? I'm off. But all that, as far as I'm the orphan roof. I mean, she yeah. had all her dialogue and her language. Were, 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 the, were the actors these were? Yes, they were. I mean, some of them were, I think, a couple of what I know were actors, about two or three of them. And some I'd been introduced. I can't remember so long ago. It really was tricky. Um, but they were actors, or the South African emigres in London right. who heard about it some of them were really very powerful. Yes. And, and very, they, they were, they were sh totally unashamed about the, the intensity of what they were, the interrogations. And I thought they were really very strong. Um, and as we go over, I thought the casting was right. I think they looked right into the, the voices were more authentic. Yes. Yeah. They stand to be corrected. I think they were. Yeah, they were. Yeah. And Ruth was there all the time, so she would certainly correct me if anything was going wrong. But there wasn't, you know, in the book in particular, she talks about the, the way she was treated as white men, <laughs> like um, bad madam, um, by, by the, the other waterses and the other. Certainly, the dichotomy between the whites and the black men. But it's as accurate, as accurate as we could do at the time with the resources we had to try to get the, the real bare essence of her story and keep it as simple and um, as simple but elegant. And I think her language itself is so brilliant, I mean, just as importantly on the journalistic reportage. So accurate. We try to match that with the pictures. I mean, she talks one time about they, they get into your nerve ends, and then we do it over a shot of her filing her nails, and just to hear the effect of the last thing. Nail filing through the nails, and the, the use of the lines and the dialogue. It was difficult filming to find variations of what you could do in that cell. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at it again, so a couple of times recently, because of this I've been watching it, I thought that we were quite inventive actually, to try to get variations of the way we could see them in that black nothingness. Um, little tracking shots of the use of close ups. And, and I don't know, I mean, I won't go into the technicalities, but it, I don't feel as though 
then if you get to get them all in the same shot, you know, try not to do that. Well, it's the difficulty of kind of conveying boredom without yeah. boring the audience. Yeah. I mean, what, what, I'm, I'm very curious to know what sort of feedback you got from the BBC management. Did anyone say to you, look, be careful with this because no, it's no, popular? No. So when they, they viewed it before transmission, did anyone no, say? No, no. Well, not that I remember right. at all. Right. <laughs> yeah. You're right about Carlton Green. This was the age of not so much a program to government. Yeah. Alan, Peter Watkins, yeah. Ken, people like that. So it's, it's a good time to be there. And Tony Garnett, yeah. <coughs> <coughs> so it's, um, but it, it's an interesting, technically, I mean, aesthetically, an interesting film to try and make of a person in a four walls and maintain the interest. But I think she is. Star, she's amazing. She yeah. is yeah. absolutely compulsive. Yeah. Yeah. The, face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the more I see her, the more I get. I mean, how intelligent. Mm -hmm. Performance. Yeah. Would yeah. you understand what I mean about cooler shots? You know, yeah. You get the face and you get the right context, and you start getting inside the psyche of the person you're pointing the camera. <coughs> but she is. I can't take my eyes off her. So intensity. Not performance. Of, I don't know what you call it. It's not, not performance. So. Well, it's powerful yeah. because <laughs> she seems to know how to act on television yeah. because it's so minimalist. Yeah. So still. Yeah. Okay, we're we're going to wind uh, the the sort of this this part of the the afternoon up by um, asking Professor Kevin Williams to say some concluding remarks. I think Leo would, would just like to uh, to introduce him if that's the plan. So we'll, we'll take a, a back seat. Of so thank you very much. I really, I really just want to say a, a few words, uh, really as a way of introducing Gavin, but also just to talk very briefly about the project of which today um, and the symposium that we had in June is, is a part. And this is a project digitizing this extraordinary archive of Ruth Furst's work that is at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and creating an online resource center. It's a project, the Ruth Furst Papers project, that I'm involved with, with Matt, with Stephanie, with Virgilio, Vanessa, and Rob, and that we, in the process, and it's at the very early stages of digitizing just a fraction of just a fraction of Ruth Ruth Hurst's, um, papers in, in the archive. We're at something like two and a half percent. And like the original peel that came out in the early um, 80s, so after Ruth's assassination, there was um, there was an appeal for funds, and that's of course um, the lifeblood for continuing the digitization, creating this resource where we'll hope, hopefully at some point later this year, be streaming Jack's extraordinary documentary. So it'll be reaching to the question that was asked about who else will see it, you know, hopefully mm -hmm. it will reach that audience. I've got just a couple of announcements. I'm not gonna dare say that the appalling massacre that took place yesterday at the Americana Platinum mm -hmm. Mine would have enraged Ruth First. There's enough people who do that already about Ruth First's legacy and, and impose her in all sorts of contemporary, um, contemporary debates. But I can say that it has disgusted us, it has disgusted the team of people who've been inspired by Ruth First's work. And um, in some ways, I think it does go into these bigger questions of why it's important to look at the work of those awkward, difficult questions that she was always asking about the limitations, the curse of national liberation, as, as she wrote a couple of times, taking, taking, taking that from, from Fanon. Um, I want to say very briefly now, as a way of, an in, of introducing Gavin Williams, and what a great pleasure it is to have him here with us, that Gavin was perhaps Ruth's closest comrade, collaborator, fellow scholar from South Africa, was involved 
in a whole range of different scholarly and activist initiatives with Ruth when she was in exile, particularly in the UK from 64. Um, particularly um, in the founding of the Extraordinary Review of African Political Economy, this fascinating project which was hoping to follow through with thorough analysis the um, contemporary political economy of, of Africa, but with politics and activism at its core, understanding the world in order to change it, as, as, um, as the founding statement of the journal said. Um, and like Ruth Furness, Gavin has been a pioneer, really, in understanding the continent and the politics on the continent, not just in South Africa, of which his scholarship is well known, but in Nigeria, and like Ruth, um, arguments and research that include the whole of the, the continent. So just before Gavin speaks, I would like to say one other thing, which is that the, the, the other extraordinary freedom fighter, um, Neville Alexander, a figure um, who many people here will know, um, is incredibly ill. We hear that um, he's, he's um, going to struggle through um, the, next, um, the next few days. And I'd like to say on behalf of the Ruth First Papers team that we salute another incredible um, fighter for African um, liberation, Southern African freedom. So um, I, I, I hope um, perhaps Gavin will say a few words and we can discuss in the wine reception afterwards. So it's a great, it's a great pleasure to have Gavin speaking to us today about Ruth First. Um, he will speak for about 20 minutes and then afterwards um, we'll be able to continue to celebrate um, Ruth's extraordinary life and raise a glass to to Neville Alexander as well in the wine reception, which is going to be taking place in the, the bar at the front. So thank you very much. Go. If I may also sit. Uh, many thanks for the introduction. I would suggest, though, that it's very sad that the person most competent to do an introduction, namely the late Robert Siegel, uh, could not be doing it. He was not only, I think, Ruth's closest friend in a variety of contexts, not least in encouraging her to write 117 days. He writes a preface to an edition which is produced after her death. He was, of course, editor of the Penguin African series, which included her books on Southwest Africa and Libya. And apart from his own prolific output, remained close to Ruth and supportive of her activities as a writer, even though she moved away from the need to publish in the Penguin Africa series. Her academic career, with which I was involved, we taught together at Durham University, was truthfully made possible by these publications and by the sorts of recognition she could get from publishing in the series. But it's also true of Ronald that he was always a critical eye for Ruth, as for many other people. He was a very, very demanding editor, though I'm not sure that Ruth needed that degree of editing. She was a very tough in the way she edited her own work. I'd like to start by saying that at present, particularly in South Africa, there is a representation of Ruth as an icon of the revolutionary hero. Now, I think this is too much to claim for her. Certainly is what, not what she would ever have thought of claiming for herself. But I also think it is to make too little of her. It, as it were, hides the person behind the mirror, displaces her into some sort of representation rather than to the person herself. One of the major, one of the most important things for me about this film is precisely that it does not treat Ruth in this way, and that we see somebody who is able to do two things. Firstly, to act through her own experience, not to make a great um, claims on 
her own contribution to the revolutionary movement, which had been and continued to be very important. But because she saw it as a politically important act in its own right. The second reason, and that's even more clear, I think, in the book 117 Days, is the extent to which it is revealing of Ruth's personal honesty in recognizing her own limitations, her own vulnerabilities, which for somebody who was intensely private about her own life, I think was very, very <coughs> difficult. She wasn't somebody who, as Ronald Siegel puts it again in his introduction, was somebody with whom the private and the public life more or less coincided. She was somebody for whom her private life was, in important respects, separate from the public persona and from the person who is addressing meetings outside South Africa House or engaged in um, as one of the core people in the events of Rivonia. One other feature of this book, which if you read it before, I can only say you should do as I have recently done, read it again, which does not and I think could not come out in the film, is the perceptiveness with which she writes about the people around her, in particular the perceptive with which, perceptiveness with, with which she writes about the warders. On the one hand they are, I can't quite remember the four names, there's raucous, there's shrill, there's competent, and I've forgotten the fourth one. But these aren't simply caricatures, though they're quite nicely, they're quite nicely presented in some ways as caricatures. These are also people who are living their own lives with their own, co with their own personal histories and the context within which they're living them. So that we get here a picture not just simply of somebody imprisoned by the system and by the people acting on behalf of the system, we also get a picture of the people who are doing the imprisoning and who in some important respect are themselves imprisoned by the context in which they live, the sorts of things they take for granted, the sorts of things which are not to be questioned in their own lives and a part of the ways in which they make their own lives for them. Very interesting comment is that the key people who were employed in the prison as women warders were wives of people who had been police killed in the line of duty. It's a small comment, but it tells you quite a lot about those people and about the context of a society in which she herself was engaged, not just simply about the revolutionary struggle. One of the ways in which I found this book very interesting is, of course, the way in which, it's clear from the film, the way in which Ruth's life is contextualized. It's very easy to read somebody's life backwards, in this case, from the assassination of Ruth by the South African security forces, in my interpretation, in part, to simply prove that they could do it. Famously, she ends the book by saying, well, and they will come again. Let me find the exact passage. When they left me on my own, I was convinced it was not the end. They would come again. And of course, she would not know how prescient that was. But it is terribly easy to read what is happening in the 1960s and her imprisonment, I think it's 1963, um, in the light of what happens in 1982. We are dealing with a politically different world, different in some important respects. Um, the question of communist sympathies arises. And its own account is fairly straightforward of this, and it's one, I think, which 
um, makes sense to me, uh, and that is that in confronting the evils of a political system before and after 1948 of that particular society, it seemed obvious to be able to take up issues and causes the 46 miners strike, the beginnings and continuation of prison farms and so forth. This seemed to be obvious and the organization was directly engaged in addressing these questions involved in the conflict over these questions was the Communist Party. So it doesn't surprise me that among many other radical white South Africans, Ruth should not only have been but continued to be a active in the Communist Party in the ANC and in Mkonti Wisizwe. It is also of course true that she distanced herself later from aspects of the party's policy. Ronald Seale said once, if you want to understand Ruth first, then read about Rosa Luxemburg. It's not I think that Ruth had read Rosa Luxemburg as a model on whom to base her actions. It's more that those particular sorts of sensitivities and vulnerabilities, together with a strong commitment, almost a duty, taking her to revolutionary action is something which they shared. She could not know that what they would share is being assassinated. Again, I think the point of this film and the book is that they can enable us to understand somebody outside that particular context and not to try to read their lives backwards. Thank you. Maybe it's a good chance, only because um, Gavin's finished a little earlier than I thought that we could um, take some questions or um, observations, memories even, from people here just for five or ten minutes. Um, and then we'll have the break for the, for the wine reception. How do people feel about that? I can see some people in the audience who, who knew Ruth well, who also were at um, Durham with her, so I won't signal signal any of you out. <laughs> yes. I, mean, I was a student at Durham and um, she was a tough person. She um, was angry with me that I hadn't presented myself. Um, I kept away from the South African community because I had my passport still but I wanted to be active. Um, she did lead this big, we had a big um, meeting on disinvestment. The university had huge investments in South Africa, and she ra uh, rallied me and another South African. We were the only blacks in the meeting, full with the dean and everyone there. And she gave a very passionate, strong speech. But um, I think the majority of the 99% of the audience were um, for investment in South Africa. It was a very, very conservative university. Um, very sad, um, but she was, you know, the, so I would say. She went on. She went on, of course, to to teach in Maputo and um, obviously adapting courses, but using some of the experience of teaching in Durham on a variety of courses in um, at the Centre of African Studies and at the University. Any other? Um, Questions also to Gavin. Um, anything else? Gavin, can, is it possible to say why maybe Ruth was or became the internal critic of the party in a way that Joe never did until even the very end of his life? He never ever criticised the Soviet Union. He never. Well, he, I didn't get the impression he was as self-reflective in the way that Ruth was. Is that just down to individual personal traits? Okay. Any other questions and then I can get Gavin to, to come back. Gary? I've got an observation. It's about, about the treatment of white women. 
Uh, it wasn't much different 20 years later, but Jan Pasteur, who also knew that was impressed by the South Africans, which was called to smuggling stuff into South Africa. The only difference was they had a TV camera and the, the lights on 24 hours a day, and they only interrogated her when they could see that she was at a low point. <coughs> and she, I think she was doing that for a couple of years. But uh, again, there was no physical torture. So that was a big distinction. It's still, been, it's still going on in the 1980s. Whereas they would brutally you know, torture and beat up blacks and you know, anybody else. A bit louder, I don't suppose. I think everybody's raised some of the issues which I'm afraid I found it rather um, difficult to develop what I had to say, um, perhaps efficiently, but as you understand, um, I don't find it very easy to talk about it, even after all of these years. Um, let me come back to the last point. It is something I should have brought up because one of the features of Peru's writing is the clear precision with which he writes. This is true of her academic writing as well. Short, clear sentences. Um, and in this particular case, they are not so much based on um, a broader understanding of political processes so much as of particular events. So I think the ability to observe the war vessels and I think to gain some understanding of who they were and when they came from arose partly because of her experience as an observant journalist familiar with identifying the particular and understanding the more general through the particular. Come, I mean, I'll come back to that point in a moment, if I may. Let me go on to some other questions. One was the question about Ruth's relationship with the party. Well, I can't speak for Joe Slover. I have no intention of doing so. Um, or for his um, political outlook. He was key in the movement. He was also, of course, a very good lawyer. And lawyers, I think, are people who take on the responsibility of acting as advocates and, in this case, also as political leaders. But beyond that, um, I can't speak for Joe's particular views. I know that where Ruth particularly distanced herself, at least privately, from the politics of the South African Communist Party was the invasion of Czechoslovakia. It was made clear to her, and I think was clear to her, that this was not a license to um, publicly denounce the Communist Party, let alone its relationship with the ANC. Indeed, I think she thought it quite important not to do that. She only publicly came to make a statement which was very clearly out of line with um, Communist Party policy, at the time of the Eritrean Liberation War, where she took the side of the Eritreans, the Eritrean Liberation Movement. I think she was wrong to do that, actually, if you look at their, um, if you look at them at the present. Uh, she also, at that time, at an anti-apartheid movement meeting, criticized the anti-apartheid movement meeting, uh, anti-apartheid for its uncritical um, support for Joshua and Como. Again, she may have been wrong on that point as well. But when she did that, contrary to what was clearly the party line, in large hall she was hissed, which is, I think, tells you something at least about the anti apartheid movement and the place of the party in it. Um, on that occasion, I was sitting right next to her. And just to complete the story, while we were sitting next to each other, who should pitch up and sit next to me in order clearly to keep an eye on Ruth? But one time with and Becky. <laughs> 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 I won't continue the story in just for a moment. Um, it's true 
Okay, <laughs> what he was doing. Um, we go back to Durham University, where Ruth was a very effective teacher, where, I've written this elsewhere, she didn't particularly engage in all the great Marxist debates at the time. She was much more empirical in her concerns. Theory was for explaining things, not an activity which people should engage in in its own right. As a teacher, I think this is exemplified, but, um, I think it was the year I left her, and a group of students produced a Romeoed uh, pamphlet called What is to be done? <laughs> this was not about the uh, great task of the revolutionary movement. This was about which options to take in your final year. <laughs> <laughs> The point, of course, is straightforward. Unlike, for example, Oxford, where I've been teaching, where a course might be taught by a whole range of different people, in a, in a place like Durham, if you took, let's say, African politics or sociological theory, you were choosing the person who would choose that subject. So this was really about people, some of whom were not at all pleased to have this um, uh, critical view cast on them by their students. Uh, the one for Sociology of Development read, Ruth rules, okay. <laughs> Ruth pointed out to me that this was uh, very, very ambiguous and not as straightforward as it looks. <laughs> I said I'd try to come back to the question of the ways in which Ruth wrote. She always said that if asked what she was, that she was a journalist. She was editor and also key writer of a whole series of magazines, which points, as she points out, one after the other got banned and then reappears under a new name. That is the context, I think, in which this ability to bring out powerful political issues through the account of very specific events develops. Um, this is the uh, context in which she doesn't so much learn how to do that, she comes to do it. Now, where I think this is relevant to this film we've seen and to this book is that this is a way of understanding South Africa, not just simply because she has a relationship with the wardresses, the warders, the interrogators, however conflictual, antagonistic and appalling these might be, but because in quite important ways they do tell you something about the intersections of people within a wider, within the context of a wider society. So again, I think we can see the particular, not simply as about being Ruth's experiences, or a standard prison memoir, or a standard denunciation of the evils of the system, though it is clearly that and brings that out very clearly, very effectively, but through an account of her particular experiences, intentionally or otherwise, it gives us an exceptional understanding, a way of understanding through the intersections, part or aspects of the society through which, through which I'd emphasize, she is living at this time. Thank you very much, Kevin. I, th I think probably um, we can continue the discussion um, um, in the bar with a glass of wine. So it's re really the last thing to do is just to thank Gavin, Jack, Philip, and of course the Ruth First team and everyone for coming. And um, please do um, stay with us for, for a little while longer so we can continue this in in extraordinary and important discussion about um, Ruth First. Thank you very much.